This morning we are going to continue our series of messages on the hard sayings of Jesus. And I've enjoyed speaking to you on these various uh, statements that Jesus has made. And these statements have been a real challenge to us as they have helped us to understand uh, Jesus' teaching. Uh, We have been learning that these verses um, are hard to understand and harder still to practice. And of course, the verses I'm talking about are from Matthew chapter 5. And we have learned together that Jesus has a standard of excellence for you and me. And by that, I'm not just referring to the Ten Commandments as a way of showing us that we need to embrace Jesus as our Lord and Savior because we know that in our pre-conversion life that we lived with little regard for whether or not we broke the commands. But now Jesus is talking to his followers. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. And he's telling us that his standard has not changed that he still wants excellence. Be perfect as I am perfect, this chapter ends with saying. And it reminds us how much we need God's grace on a daily basis. That confession isn't just something, an, an activity that we did on the day that we gave our lives to Jesus. It should be a regular part of our life because these commands of Jesus, these hard sayings of Jesus, remind us of how difficult it is to get things right in our life. How we need to be careful that we don't make the same mistake that the Pharisees made. So they had what we would call today tunnel vision. They applied each one of these sayings of Jesus to something that was very particular and easy to manage. So they could say things like, I'm okay because I have never murdered anybody. I'm okay because I have never committed adultery. But these sayings go far deeper. And they tell us that Jesus is more concerned about attitude, our inner life, than he is our actions. And so today we're going to look at swearing. And we're going to learn together that Jesus had more in mind than just using God's name as a curse word. When he tells us that we should not swear, he shows us things that perhaps we had never thought of when we consider it. I find that today, that even for believers, it's too easy for us to use God's name in a way of And we are going to see that one of those ways is when it comes to calling upon God to be a witness that we're telling the truth. I want to illustrate this for you this morning in a rather humorous way. When I was a teenager, one of the most popular sitcoms on television was a show by the name of WKRP. And whenever anyone thinks of WKRP, they think of this episode that I'm going to, tell, to show you now. And I want you to pay particular attention to the very last line that's spoken, because we're going to use that as a diving board into our topic today. All right, fellow babies, and now it's time to go to our live remote man on the scene at the Pinedale Shopping Mall for the big WKRP turkey giveaway. So take it away, Les Nessman. This is Les Nessman, your man on the scene here at the Pinedale Shopping Center where the excitement is mounting. We're here to witness the big WKRP turkey Thanksgiving giveaway. Hey, you got permission to be out here? What? You're blocking my store here, buddy. Don't you know who I am? Uh. I'm Les Nesman. I won the Buckeye News Hawk Award last year. (laughs) Good for you, Buckeye. Now get out of my doorway. I'm sorry. Creep? (laughs) So far, so good. I'm here with hundreds of people who have gathered to witness what has been described as perhaps the greatest turkey event in Thanksgiving Day history. All we know for sure is that in a very few moments, there are going to be a lot of happy people out here. Now, the crowd is... The the crowd is... uh, (laughs) 
curious, but well-behaved. And I think I hear something now. Uh, the crowd is moving out into the parking area. And, oh yes, I can see it now. It's a, it, it's a helicopter. And it's coming this way. A helicopter? It's flying something behind it. I can't quite make it out. It's a large banner. And it says, uh, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> From W. Ladies and gentlemen, what a sight. The copter seems to be circling the parking area now. I guess it's looking for a place to land. No, something just came out of the back of the helicopter. It's uh, a dark object. Uh, perhaps a skydiver plummeting to the earth from only 2,000 feet into the air. Second, the third. There's no parachutes yet. shopping mall has just been bombed with live turkey. <laughs> Film at 11. As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. As God is my witness. Those are words that Jesus would like us to, to focus in on because they come to the point of what he was saying in these verses of Scripture. And we're now going to turn to the passage in Matthew 5, and I want to read a, a selection of three verses uh, for you. Do we have those on the screen, or should I uh, read them from the Scriptures? Okay, uh, they read this way. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear. <laughs> An oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Now think about those words for a second, because you might think that they are incredibly harsh. All you need to say is yes or no. Anything beyond that, any oath-taking, any irreverent use of God's name, the calling on God as your witness that you're telling the truth, Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, forbids all of it. 
So why is that the case? As we go on to our next slide, why is it that Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and he tells us that we should not take the Lord's name in vain? Why does he tell us that and then apply it to this passage of Scripture? Well, let's go back to that commandment. And let's focus our thoughts on it for a second. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. So you, like me, were brought up being taught that Christ's followers didn't swear. That oh my should end with a why and not have further words added to it. And I have found increasingly that even God-fearing people are becoming lax when it comes to not taking God's name in vain, to not swearing. And so when we were taught this passage, that's just about all that we were taught that it meant. But I want to tell you that the Jews in the Old Testament, as they thought about that, even come across their mind to use God's name as a swear word. You see, they held God's name so reverently that they were even afraid to pronounce it. God was called Yahweh in Hebrew, and the Jews didn't even like to use his name for fear that they would use it irreverently. How far things have, have gone from that point in time. One of the ways in the Old Testament that the people used God's name was to be a witness of truth. And so they would say, like what we saw in our opening video, I am telling you the truth as God is my witness. The only thing is that they developed this pretty elaborate system. God intended, when it came to oath-taking, that people, his followers, be respected as individuals who always told the truth. But the Jews, when they looked at this commandment and when it came to, to oath-taking, took it a step further. And so, here's kind of what we would call the game that they played. They said, you could make an oath, and if you made it by heaven, I swear in heaven's name that I'm telling the truth, if you made it in the name of the temple, I swear in the name of the temple that we worship in, or I swear by the head that is on my shoulders, they believed that that oath had a lesser level of honesty associated with it. So if you wanted to convince someone that you were telling the truth, you made an oath in God's name. And everybody instantly knew that person, what they are saying, is the truth. But if you made an oath in the name of heaven, uh, there was a little bit of a shadow of doubt in there of whether you were telling the truth or not. And the Jews developed this as a way of circumventing God's rule for speaking honestly that we should not lie or, or not bear false witness. Jesus, when he was asked by the people to arbitrate this, Jesus was asked whether it was okay to swear by lesser things, Jesus said something that was pretty interesting. He said, don't swear at all, because it's not a reverent use of God's name, first and foremost. And second, if you swear by something else, people are going to assume that God-fearing people 
in some circumstances are permitted to lie. And the standard that God has for God-fearing people is much higher than that. It is always honesty. And so Jesus said to the people, Yet you, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And that settles it. What he's saying to us is the very fact that we are believers and that we are known to be followers of Jesus in our community means that when people talk to us, that they know without a shadow of a doubt that we are telling the truth, that we wouldn't lie. And because of that, we don't need to swear to anyone to convince them that we're telling the truth. You see, the assumption is that people lie. And that when someone talks to you, they may be telling you the truth, and they may not be telling you the truth. And Jesus says in this passage of Scripture that that can never be the case for people who follow Him. I don't know about you, but when someone makes a statement to me and then says, follows it up with, I swear that that's the truth. The immediate thought that goes into my mind is, hmm, I wonder if it really is the truth. Or if they have to say that right now, I wonder if there's times that they haven't told me the truth in the past. And in a way, this is counterproductive. It's much better for us to take Jesus' word and just do the best of our ability to always see, tell the truth so that when people see us, they can respect us that way. Our next slide reminds us that our word needs to be our bond. That when we speak, that settles it. And there's nothing more. No convincing needs to be made. We speak it. People know our character. And they respect us for telling the truth. One of our children's favorite bedtime stories was that of Pinocchio. And you know the story behind Pinocchio. Uh, whose picture will be on the screen momentarily. Uh, Pinocchio, um, every time he told a lie, what happened? His nose grew and grew. And we see in the picture that it must have been just a little lie because his nose isn't that long right now. Now, here's what happens. The more that we lie the easier it becomes to lie. And we begin to excuse our actions. In some circumstances, it's all right to stretch the truth a little bit. In some circumstances, it's all right to tell the little white lie. Because we don't have noses that grow like Pinocchio. No one will ever know if we get away with it. Did you steal that cookie out of the cookie jar after I told you not to? Yes, I'm speaking from personal experience. No, Mom, I didn't take it, as the cookie crumbs are on the side of my mouth. You see, what happens is that our conscience becomes seared. And we can lie when the need demands it with a straight face that's so convincing that people think it's the truth. The more we do it, the easier it becomes. And Jesus is saying in this pa passage, tell the truth in all circumstances. There's a little bit more to the cookie story that I told you. When I was little, my mom and dad quite often on Sunday night after church would have uh, company over. And my mom um, would always um, have something in the freezer so that she could take it out and uh, share it with the company. 
and she makes and still does make the, the, the best chocolate chip and walnut cookie that you've ever eaten. And I learned very early on that they taste just as good frozen as they do thawed. And so downstairs we had a rec room, and my mom kept the freezer down by the, the rec room. And when I was in watching TV and mom and dad were upstairs, it was a short walk to go over and open the freezer and open the container and get out a cookie. After all, who's going to notice? There's 24 cookies in it. I take one, there's still 23. The logic continued. There's 23 cookies in it. I'll take another one. will be 22. Well, who will know that it was two dozen? We'll just make it an even dozen as the days get on. My mom went to get the cookies to share with the, the company one Sunday evening. There were two left. Stephen, did you eat those cookies? Well, the, the jig was up. I had to admit that I ate the cookies, and I really don't remember the rest of the story of what she fed the company that night. I can just rem remember that I got in quite a bit of trouble for stealing cookies. You and I need to tell the truth in all circumstances. We need to be men and women of our word. Jesus said, yet let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so when we think of Jesus' words, we can't think, well, I haven't taken God's name in vain. We can't think, well, I haven't called upon God as a witness. We need to take it one step further and say, in my heart of hearts, do I tell the truth? And am I a person of my word? So that when people see me and ask me a question, they know that I am telling the truth in all circumstances. I know that that raises the bar high. But the good news for us is that God offers us His grace even after repeated failure. When we come to Him and tell Him that we have failed, He will always forgive us because of what Jesus has done. And so I challenge you today, be known as people in this community who speak the truth. That when we talk, it's not a tall tale. It's not an exaggeration. And we're not trying to convince people that what we're saying is right. Rather, we say what we have to say. Leaving people with the truth and knowing they respect us for it. This morning, whether you're here in person or, or whether you're online listening, maybe today you've never come to the place where you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never come to the place where you even considered that oath-taking, trying to convince people that you were telling the truth was wrong. Maybe you've never come to the place where you even thought about how you're supposed to use God's name in a reverent manner and you've used His name as a swear, swear word or a curse word. Today, the good news for you is that God loves you and wants to enter into a relationship with you and He will forgive you for this sin as He will any sin. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a, a prayer so that you can... Confess your sin and ask Jesus to be your Savior. But before I do, I want to point out that there's one area of oath-taking that I haven't touched on. And that happens when any of you are called to go to court and ask to swear that you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. And you place your hand on a Bible. If you want to join our Zoom session uh, today at 12 as we dive deeper into this, uh, we're going to talk more about that. But first, bow your heads and pray with me. Father in heaven, for the first time, I understand that I need to speak your name reverently and that I haven't done this. I haven't even given thought to it. And today, O oh God, I ask, that you would forgive me. I accept Jesus 
as my Lord and Savior. And because of his sacrifice, I ask that you would pardon this sin and all sins. Your word promises that we, if we confess our sin, that you will welcome us into your family. Father, I want to be respected as one of your followers. And so I ask that you would forgive me for my wrong, that you would fill me with your spirit to strengthen me to do what is right. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may God bless you. May God let his face shine upon you. And may God keep you safe this week as you leave this building determined to be known as people of the word. God bless.